After some rain, some sun and a couple of dodgy clutches, Formula One and the Dutch Grand Prix celebrated a rather different shade of orange as Lando Norris dominated at Zandvoort. Winning the race by over 22 seconds ahead of the home hero Max Verstappen with Charles Leclerc finishing third for Ferrari. But before we get to the analysis of the race, here is the result. Well, as I say, Lando Norris won the race and secured the fastest lap to gain 26 points. He finished ahead of Max Verstappen, who gained 18. Then Charles Leclerc, Oscar Piastri, Carlos Sainz, Sergio Perez in sixth. Then the two Mercedes, seventh and eighth, Russell and Hamilton, respectively. Pierre Gasly in ninth and Fernando Alonso rounding out the points all the way to the very bottom. And it was the two Saubers once again, finishing 19th and 20th, Bottas and Zhou Guan Yu. Well, joining me to make sense of it all, I'm delighted to have once again Jake Boxall Leg, aka JBL, and Philip Clear. And first of all, JBL, how are you doing? I'm pretty good, thank you. Um, yeah, it's nice to sort of have everything sort of back, uh, back on the F1 hamster wheel. So yeah, looking forward to seeing how the second half of the season goes on. It's not as creaky as it was before. Hey, uh, Phil, how are you getting on? Yeah, very well. I like JBL. I'm really excited to have uh, another ten races um, to see what happens and see if. Uh, McLaren can do it, and especially see if Landon Norris can do it. It's a, it's, it's a nice dynamic note, and we've got a lot to unpack, I think. We certainly do. Well, let's start there where you left off, Phil, and talk Lando Norris dominating the race. That was the biggest winning margin in Formula 1 since Hungary 2023. How surprising was it to see him win so comfortably, JBL? I think by that margin, it was a little bit of a surprise. I think this was the, this was the sort of vein of performance that was always going to going to emerge. And obviously, before the summer break, McLaren hadn't put a lot of resources. Oh well, sorry, it hadn't put a lot of effort into bringing upgrades into the first half of the season because it was pulling all of its resources into the second half. So it had brought that Miami upgrade. Um, it brought small kind of track specific bits uh, in the interim, but it seemed that all of that wind tunnel time, all of that resource, all of that money that they'd ring fenced for upgrades and that sort of thing, that was being pushed towards the um, after the summer break. And so with that, what you've then got is they've got more time in the second half of the season to spend on potentially further upgrades or to get the ball rolling on next year's car. So it puts them in a really good position updates wise, but all of that culminated in McLaren having, having a very, very solid basis for, for the car this weekend. Um, Zandvoort seemed to play to its new strengths um, that have sort of been brought into place with the new rear wing, which I can probably touch on a bit later on. Although it wasn't entirely surprising to see him take the win uh, by that margin over Max Verstappen, um, it was quite a statement, certainly. Yeah, it was certainly a whopping victory, as you say. Phil, how much did McLaren's new upgrade package have to do with that dominance in Zandvoort? Well, listening to Andrea Stolle, it certainly seems that it did work. It's McLaren is sort of a unicorn in that it, you know, everything it does sort of works, and a lot of teams are struggling to put upgrades on a card and actually do what they promised in in sort of in the wind tunnel. So it's another McLaren update that worked. Um, how how big was it? I mean, we think they already had the fastest car without it. Um, so is it going to be three times worth that the gap was to for Stappen in qualifying? I don't think so. I don't, it's probably going to be less than that. But it's it's impressive to see another upgrade that works. I mean, a new race coupe, front and rear suspension, um, that all sort of plays together in, in optimizing the airflow. And then you've got another high downforce wing. Um, not as high downforce as as a wing rebel user. It was a little bit lower in, in in spec, but still, you know, another upgrade. And it's interesting to see McLaren um, tackle their weaknesses, as Jake touched upon. You know, we know they were never very good at aerodynamic efficiency, and now we've seen them every type of circuit they go to to bring a new rear wing, and uh, it's more efficient than the previous one, and and it's going to stand them in good stead. So, yeah, impressive. Um, it's not, you know entirely down to the upgrades that the winning margin or the pull margin was that big but it, it certainly played a part and just to uh, add to that as well the other aspect of it was um with regards to drs efficiency as well so that's a trick that we've known red bull has had for for a very long time well last season since the start of last season um and what you'd get is you have essentially you have the diffuser the beam wing and the 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 main rear wing all kind of working together 
um, they sort of they're all coupled up and they're all you know responsible for producing uh, the rear end downforce. And so when you're coupling them up, you get this weight pattern behind them. And what this does is it improves the acceleration of the airflow underneath the floor, so it gets the floor working a little bit harder as well. So that's where you're creating rear end downforce. When you apply the DRS, um, it creates that decoupling effect, so that wake zone is reduced a lot more. So perhaps the floor's not working as harder. Um, the beam wing is also quite shallow. Uh, let's say, take the Red Bull, for example. It was very shallow last year. So when they opened the DRS, that decoupling effect was a bit bigger. Um, and that's something that I think all the other teams kind of copied, uh, cottoned on to. Um, McLaren took that forward and said, okay, how can we make this even better? Um, and I think that's pretty evident in comparing Norris versus Verstappen's laps between Hungary and Zambor. And this is this was something pointed out to be by my colleague Alex Kalanorkas, who'd sort of taken a look at the GPS data and gone, oh, do you think there's something in this? So I had a quick look. You've got two sort of big, well, not very big, but two straights at Hungary with DRS. You've got the start-finish straight, and then you've got from turn one to turn two. In both of those, Norris, top speed-wise, was behind Verstappen. Um, now in Zandvoort, if you take a sort of equivalent straight, so that's between uh, turn 10 and turn 11, um, Norris is up by the same margin Verstappen was in Hungary. So there's a reversal here that with DRS applied, um, McLaren has now uncovered a little bit more top speed. Now, there are caveats. Um, Verstappen was in a slightly higher downforce package. Perez was in a lower downforce package relative to relative to his teammate, but also relative to Norris as well. Um, so he did have more top speed, but there's the trade-off there in that Perez was all over the place in the other sectors. And so that's why he wasn't as quick as was happening in qualifying. Um, but it's really interesting to see how McLaren has kind of taken that on board um, and, and moved it on a little bit more as well. You don't want to just sort of match Red Bull and innovate. You want to match Red Bull and go, okay, how can we beat them? How can we improve upon that? So um, that's something that McLaren has taken care to do. Obviously, improving the efficiency is number one goal, but getting the DRS to be even more powerful, uh, that's another another big step. Is it unusual that this season we're seeing quite a lot of teams being surprised by their performance on track over what they expect, whether it's positive or negative, Phil? It does seem to be quite a lot this year where teams are saying, blimey, we got much more performance than we expected, or sometimes... Don't know, don't know what happened there. Yeah, I think it's very much inherent to these rules where there's sort of a black art of um, translating what you see in the wind tunnel in pristine conditions with no bumps and no no yaw and no wind to a racetrack where you do have all these bumps and these cars are so low to the ground with these ground effect rules that they get upset so quickly and they generate downfalls in in different places in different ways. So having the balance between low speed and high speed is sort of the holy grail of, of how to make a 2024 F1 car sing. And we've seen a lot of teams that are just struggling to keep your car in the window because whether it's tire temperatures, whether it's ride heights, it's very easy to fall into it and then fall out of it again. So I think that's um, a big factor in, in why so many teams have struggled to put on um, upgrades and why, for example, we've seen with Mercedes uh, in Zandvoort, they suddenly fell out of the window uh, or at least um, Lewis did in qualifying and it was just suddenly nowhere so yeah it's it's very much these rules and it, I don't think every any team has like a 100% understanding of, of how to keep their car balanced and in the window throughout any race yeah it certainly makes for some surprises doesn't it what about Red Bull then JBL so was this down to McLaren being utterly dominant from Norris's perspective or was it down to Red Bull experimenting with their setup and just to add to that as well is it right, do you think, that Helmut Marko is so alarmed at the performance of the McLaren? And should he be? Uh, I think he probably should be, um, if I'm being honest. And there was a lot of there's a, a lot of experimentation going on at Red Bull to a certain degree. Um, Perez and Verstappen were on two different aerodynamic platforms. So Perez had a slightly more low downforce package. Uh, at the most recent floor upgrade, uh, Verstappen, I believe, rolled back to an old floor and had a slightly higher downforce package because Red Bull was anticipating a lot more tyre deg that didn't really come during the race. But that, I don't think that explains the half second a lap advantage that Norris had for the majority of the race. I think looking at Red Bull's progress through the year, it has 
stalled out. Um, the upgrades that the team has brought haven't necessarily brought the performance gains the, that they've wanted. In fact, actually, I think if you listen to Verstappen um, throughout the year, whatever they have brought seems to have induced some, uh, let's say, less than hoped for steering characteristics. And he's finding it really, really difficult to kind of get on top of it. We speak about this relatively because it's still a fantastic car and it's still the second best car on a grid if we assume that McLaren is now the fastest. Um, and it does sort of like smack of Mercedes' uh, last couple of years declaring a disaster despite having the second, third best car on the grid. That's just how ultimately competitive they are. Um, but yeah, just I think Red Bull has not been able to tap into what makes the RB20 tick. Um, and that's the main thing here. Um, they speak of needing to bring more upgrades, but what good is that if they don't work? Um, if they sort of don't take to the car and, you know, th th there's kind of no point. And it's almost like they need to go back and rethink how do we redefine our upgrade sort of schedule? How do we redefine how we um, work with uh, our simulations and work with the wind tunnel data and that kind of thing to produce new upgrades? Because uh, McLaren seems to have got it very, very right. Mercedes is getting it a little bit better. Red Bull kind of isn't. That's the, the situation here. We're going to have to see how it works out, doesn't it? Particularly when it comes down to the Constructors' Championship. And there's some concern about the Drivers' Championship as well. Uh, Phil, what about Red Bull? Are they going to be able to mitigate this uh, these issues they have heading to Monza? If you listen to Max Verstappen, this is something that's been happening basically since Miami. That the car hasn't been balanced. So the fact that you haven't been able to solve it in two or three months is a bit concerning. So I don't certainly expect them to find a magic bullet overnight. I think the fact that they did diverge on center between Perez and, and Verstappen, um, which is not really by design, it's just they took a different choice because of the lack of running, so they had to gamble on on the car setup, and you know, uh, turns out that you know they were going in a very different direction. That that may give them some answers. The fact that they've got data from two different packages on the same circuit in the same race. Uh, maybe they'll be able to optimize a few things, but I don't think they will certainly find um, the perfect balance that they were chasing for three months. So as a whole, for the rest of the season, I'm not sh that convinced that they can get on par with McLaren again because they would have to bring some significant changes, I think, rather than just optimize what they have. For next week in Monza, historically, it's been a good rebel circuit. As Jake Biel touched upon, very good efficiency, very good DRS switch, which is very crucial there in qualifying. Um, yes, they were beaten to pole last year by, by Ferrari, not, let's not forget. So Ferrari had a bit of a, a Monza special there for the Tifosi, uh, especially for one lap. Um, but I think it'll be close. I don't think it'll be as big as as, uh, as in out for, but we'll see. McLaren have, have improved their efficiency, as, as we discussed, so um, they've promised more upgrades there as well. So it wouldn't surprise me if they brought another rear wing there that is a bit more efficient, uh, a bit more optimized for for a low speed, um, for a high speed low down for circuit. So I think it will be difficult, but I, I do think Monza in particular will be a, quite a close one. Uh, but then you go to circuits like Singapore, where obviously Rebel were very, um, very much in trouble last year. I don't think that will change at all because they haven't been able to fix those issues. So if you look at the balance of circuits that are coming, I, th I still think McLaren are very much in command. Extraordinary, isn't it, to see how it's all switched around here. And McLaren, yes, they're 30 points behind in the Constructors' Championship, but there's nine Grand Prix to go, and they're nibbling away at like 10 points every single Grand Prix. And there is that look at, at Lando being 70 points off with nine to go. It's not beyond the realms of possibility, is it? But, JBL, for Lando to claw back that 70 points and then gain an advantage, he needs to start nailing the starts. How much of a concern for McLaren is it that both he and Piastri are struggling off the line? And we've got a stat here that uh, Lando Norris is 0 from 6 in the American way of saying it, 0 out of 6 in leading the second lap after starting from first. So you really need to nail all parts of the race and the start is crucial. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely crucial, but I don't think it's as crucial as it was before. And that's the thing. I think McLaren's made such a step forward now that you saw that happen at the weekend. Um, you saw Verstappen take the lead. And I think a lot of people are sort of thinking, ah, here we go again. Well done, Max. Um, fourth Dutch Grand Prix win in a row. 
But the McLaren just had so much more pace that he was able to just kind of sit in his wheel tracks, not really bother getting into DRS range because um, obviously he didn't want the dirt. He had to kind of burn out his tyres, cause more deg than was originally planned for. And ultimately he was able to just keep the sort of turning the screw when it became apparent that Verstappen wasn't going to pull away. He was sort of doing, Norris was doing his times, he was doing his lap times and he was like, Max isn't pulling away here, so I can I can go get him because I'm not really pushing all that much. So I think that's the key thing now. And I think at that point, whether it is a Norris issue or whether it's a car issue, I don't think it matters as much now. And if it is a psychological Lando sitting on the front row going, am I going to lead into turn one? I don't think it matters so much now. And I think although, yes, he'll want to turn it around, I think the pressure's kind of taken off just by the performance that McLaren has. So I think, and I think it is would be the situation if Piastri had been a little bit stronger in qualifying and had out-qualified Verstappen the second, which is very much possible, um, then I think that pressure's off then at that point because maybe, you know, Piastri suffered the same sort of wheel spin. But yeah, I think in that scenario, both of those cars retain the lead if they're both on the front row together. And that's kind of what McLaren needs to do now, just make sure that both cars are on the front row. And then it just takes the pressure off of Norris so much more um, because ultimately, although they don't say that they want to use team orders, at some point they're going to have to do it because Norris is in a title fight here. Becoming a much more... uh competitive human being out on track should we say he's more consistent he's got the bit between his teeth as we say but just staying with that though it's always better isn't it if you're starting on pole that you go into turn one in the lead because you stay away from a lot of mess Phil with that in mind and also with what JBL was just saying just there how disappointed will McLaren be on Oscar Piastri's performance because he was out qualified by his teammate he got stuck behind uh, Charles Leclerc and this is in a car the same car that finished 22, 23 seconds ahead of the rest. I think there'll be a little bit of concern. I mean, um, Oscar has not had a great time against Lando in qualifying this year. So that poor final lap in Q3 really cost him um, because otherwise he really should have been on the front row. If you look at the gap between Norris and, and Verstappen, then you know, he could have easily fit in, in that with the same car as Norris. Yeah, as, as Jabel said, that really ruined his weekend because then he was stuck in traffic. Obviously, his start cost him, he lost the place to Russell, got stuck behind Russell. Um, and then after Russell Peter did had some clear air and he, he, he showed he had some pace in that car, he just couldn't show it. And the second scene, he managed to get past Russell and then he immediately went up uh, to Charles Leclerc and got stuck again in traffic. So um, you could argue, you know, why didn't he overtake them? Because Norris overtook Verstappen. Um, but I think, you know, Verstappen having that Monaco rear wing that was a bit of a parachute on the straight, uh, I think that really helped Norris in, um, in terms of top speed, Russell and Leclerc were probably a little bit more hard to overtake. Um, but yeah, going back to, to Piastri, yeah, the qualifying has to be better if you want to challenge an, uh, Lando, which you know, McLaren are very adamant they're two number one drivers. Um, maybe at some point we will have to make a choice to help Lando in a title fight, but uh, we're treating them as equal drivers, and that's what you know. That's what their whole philosophy is. But then, yeah, Oscar has to step up a little bit and 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 find a few tens in qualifying. It, it's not that he doesn't have the speed; it's just that the consistency to deliver it in Q3, the final lap, that is just so crucial. And yeah, there's definitely some room to uh, to improve there. Well, staying with the topic of disappointment, then what about Mercedes JBL? They were forced to do a two stop with their cars then going backwards, finishing 7th and 8th. Okay, finished up in the grid for, for Hamilton, but 7th and 8th on grid. This is a massive contrast to what we've seen more recently where they've won three out of the last four Grand Prix. What do we put this down to, the weekend just gone? Well, I kind of want to answer this by also bringing Ferrari into this as well because um, Leclerc had a stunning race and I think it was completely unexpected for a Ferrari while Mercedes expected more. So they had very, very contrasting weekends. Um, and the thing that made Leclerc's race as well was getting that one-stop strategy spot on. And yeah, he was behind He was behind Russell and he was behind Piastri at the start. Russell made a really, really good start to get into P3 uh, over Piastri. Um, but Leclerc stayed in touch with them. Um, I think Russell... Had, he pulled away from DRS range from Piastri, so he was about 1.2, 1.3 seconds ahead. And Leclerc was staying in Piastri's DRS 
room. So he was probably between, on any given lap, about a second and a half to two seconds behind Russell. Um, stopping a lap earlier than Russell, I'd, I'd sort of gone through there, contrasting uh, pit, pit lane fortunes. Leclerc's in lap was actually slower. Pit stop was was decent. Um but his outlap was pretty good. Um, versus Russell's in lap, he was a second and a half faster through sector two and sector three before you get to the point where Russell comes into the pits. Um, Russell's in lap was faster than Leclerc's comparative in lap. So, and I think that was by, hang on, my notes say 0.8 seconds. But then he lost a second in the pit lane because the stop was slow. Um, so. 0.2 in favour of Leclerc but then Leclerc's got that 1.5 second advantage so um, it's not just the slow stop that got Leclerc out ahead it was just doing a really really good in lap and, and working that undercut to perfection and trap position was super important um, and, and that's what worked for him and he was able to keep Piastri at bay dirty air kind of helped that um, pushing a little bit more when Piastri was pushing just sort of delayed the delayed the move and eventually Piastri had to back out so that was Leclerc's race for Mercedes uh, to end the pontification and get back onto the question, um, it was it was just difficult, and they were suffering from the tire degradation that others expected, and so it got to the point in the middle of the race where they knew that they were going to struggle by the end of the race anyway. Hamilton had started on softs, actually felt pretty good on them, and actually managed them pretty well. But the hard tires were, uh, I think, they were suffering for a little bit of sliding, and then sliding exacerbates the problem. Um, both cars had that and because Hamilton had stopped so much earlier anyway he was always going to do two stops that was always the the intent that he could do it basically for free because he was so far ahead of Hulkenberg at that point it, it, it was kind of moot uh, any, either way and um, uh, I think you know P8 was probably as good as it was going to get with regards to qualifying being very very miserable for him um, for Russell, it was a disappointing one because he probably could have gone to the end and he probably could have stayed ahead of Perez. But I think Mercedes was worried that that degradation was going to catch up with him. So they pulled him into the pits for the softs, hoped that he could go after Perez, but the pace just wasn't there. Um, I think he was, what, about eight seconds behind after the pit stop? Just couldn't close that gap uh, at any point. And actually, Hamilton was closer to passing Russell than Russell was to, to Perez. Um so it was just a really weird weekend where it wasn't able to get it right. We know that that Mercedes has a sort of very, very narrow operating window. Um, even though it's got all of those upgrades that have widened it and have made the floor work a little bit better and that kind of thing, it's still very, very particular to set up. If the team gets it right, it's very, very good. And there'll be situations again this year where the team does get it right and it'll be a very, very strong performer. But this was just one of the weekends where it couldn't really get it into the window. And actually, because of the, you know, them experiencing more deg in the race relative to Ferrari, that's where the fortunes kind of switched there. So um, it was a disappointing weekend, but I think it's probably, you would have to say, a one-off. Um, doesn't really... Uh, let's say, trend with their other performances this year. So we'll have to kind of wait and see on that. Last few races, we've been saying Lewis Hamilton must be looking over the fence at Ferrari and thinking, oh, have I made the wrong decision? After this one, you might be thinking, oh, no, I definitely made the right decision again. But it seems to be a, big of a bit of a flip-flop. George Russell seemed pragmatic in his response. So Lewis Hamilton said that he thought he could finish top five if he got qualification right. And as you say, the two Ferrari drivers seem to be cock-a-hoop and very, very happy with their performance. But Phil, you know, I like to... I like to focus on the negatives <laughs> and the negative this time out is what a weekend again at Williams in particular again with Logan Sargent who had that massive off in FP3 that resulted in a complete rebuild by the team and since then therefore he meant he, he missed qualifying and since then there are rumours circulating aren't there vultures are now circling around him to say maybe he'll be replaced immediately should that happen and will that happen and if so with who yeah it's hugely frustrating for williams i mean they've really been up against it this year um we all remember their their spare car situation in melbourne where sergeant had to had to withdraw from the race after a crash for album because they didn't have a third car they've really been up against it they worked so hard to get um their spare capacity built up to get um these upgrades out that they finally managed to get out in Zandford and then and then um Logan crashes, yeah, crashes pretty much every bit on a car, um, which is super frustrating. It's very, 
unnecessary as well. Just, you know, in practice, dipping a wheel on the grass. I think it's reminiscent of what he did in, in Japan uh, early this year, wasn't it? And in FB1, it's kind of similar circumstances. So, yeah, I mean, the one thing he needed to do was to be more consistent. And, and yeah, just it, it just doesn't hurt, doesn't help his case at all. And, yeah, in one way, yeah, you, you should argue for him to be replaced, but then by whom, right? Um, how many good options do you, do Williams have? What they need is somebody reliable that can bring in points um, alongside Albon wherever possible, which is not going to be easy because they have a car that maybe with these upgrades can get you know in or near the points, but it will be a battle every race. And who's available to do that? I mean, the two leading contenders have emerged to be Mick Schumacher and, and Liam Lawson. And certainly Mick Schumacher's case, I mean... Obviously, Toto Wolff and, and uh, James Valls are good friends. They know Mick very well. Well, James knows Mick very well from, from Mercedes. He, he's a contender, but then, you know, is it your former role really still waiting for, for Mick Schumacher to get another chance? I don't know. Um, you, you could argue he, he had his chance at Haas. Some people like Toto Wolff argue, you know, that was a real Mick. That wasn't a good chance. Uh, you know, Haas kind of killed his career. I mean, I don't know. I I don't think, you know, replacing one erratic driver with another because Mick had his crashes too. I don't know how that's going to help Williams for these remaining nine races. And then Liam Lawson probably makes more sense to me because he's, you know, he's likely going to be on the grid in some capacity next year. Christian Horner spoke about the option of learning him to Williams. He said, you know, if the terms are right and if we could still get him back quickly, if we need to use him as a reserve, then yeah, we are open to doing a deal with Williams, but it's up to them. So I think that signals that he's definitely a contender as well. Um, he showed last year, jumping in the car for Ricciardo at Sanford onwards, that he can do the job on short notice and he can get points. Uh, he was a pretty reliable, safe pair of hands as well. To me, I, I would probably try and do a deal with Rebel to, to get Lawson. But again, whoever they put in the car, they can't get the 2025 driver in because that's science. So, Whoever is in a car is going to have a, a tough time um, getting up to speed and, and trying to get some results. Yeah, I, I, I'm agreed with Phil on on all of those points. Um, and I think that the issue there is, uh, and you've mentioned it, is that if Red Bull can get Lawson back uh, in a reserve role, and, that, and that's not, you know, it's not going to be particularly likely, but one would imagine that James Vowles would go, well, I don't really want to risk losing a driver on that basis which I, I find unfortunate because it seems that throughout all of the discourse over drivers and that kind of thing, um, actually, Helmut Marko is doing quite a lot to try and get Lawson into Formula 1. And he says he's going to be in one of our cars next year. Um, he's he's going to do this and he's going to do that, or we at risk losing him by the start of 2025. You listen to Horner's side of the story and he goes, no, he, he, he said he'll be an A car. I mm, don't think that's what he said, mate. Um, he said he'll be in one of your cars, whether it's the RB, whether it's the Red Bull, that, that's what Marco said. It seems to me that Horner is, I don't know, he, he, he has this sort of weird approach to handling Lawson that he doesn't necessarily want him to race for anybody else. But he doesn't want to put him in any one of his own cars. And I think it's maybe he's got some big plan in mind, but just to me from the outset, it just doesn't seem like the right way to handle a young driver's career. Someone who's proven that he's good enough for Formula One because he did that last year. Um, someone that's been waiting for an opportunity and waiting very, very patiently. And it just seems a little bit of a poor show to kind of go, look, you can't have him unless you do this. You've got, you know, you've got other Red Bull drivers that can hop in as a reserve. I'm sure they've done a little bit of time in the car. So I don't really understand what the holdup is. Just, you know, stick him in the car and be done with it. Yeah, I suppose with RB and with, <laughs> nicely put, uh, I suppose with RB and with Red Bull having their seat free next year, the big question is that when the music stops, who's going to sit where? You know, what's going to happen to, to Ricardo? What's going to happen to Lawson? What's going to happen to Perez? It's just all over the place. But on that point you made there a bit earlier on, Phil, Mick Schumacher. When you look at the drivers that have had a chance in Formula One and their career going up to that point, he didn't have a great time in the Haas, but you could argue that was down to the team, the the way it, the way it ran. It wasn't a particularly good 
offering at that moment in time. But he has been really, really strong throughout his single seat race career. So is Toto Wolf right in the assertion that he should be given another chance in F1 and we haven't seen enough from Mick Schumacher and if that's Toto's idea why not stick him in the car in 2025? Well I think Toto thinks he deserves a shot but not necessarily we does it's not that good either uh, <laughs> um, no I yeah there are a lot of drivers that deserve to have a shot there's like a pool of what, 40 drivers maybe that could theoretically slot into an F1 seat uh, including former F2 champions. I mean, Felipe Drugovic is part of that. He he was an F2 champion. He's never even had a chance. So make us at two seasons, which is more than most people. Um, yes, his, his season and a half was seriously compromised. Um, but, you know, then he stuck some experienced drivers in that car and they did a lot better. So I don't know. Uh, again, you're looking for somebody reliable that doesn't crash and... Unfortunately, Mick has that reputation a little bit. So, um, does he deserve another chance? Maybe, but I, the the question is: Are other F1 teams still waiting for for Mick Schumacher to make his grand return? I'm I'm not sure that he's top of the list necessarily. I guess it's easy for a team principal to say you should give this guy a try, but we're not going to. But you you know you you be the guinea pigs and see how it works out. Uh, JBL, let's have a quick look ahead at the weekend coming then and Italy now. We know for sure that Kimi Antonelli is going to be given a test in FP1 in George Russell's car, but do you think Mercedes will go one step further and announce him for 2025? And a little additional question for you on that one. With Lewis Hamilton moving away from the team at the end of this season, why not have the test in his car? Um, So first of all, I can can touch on that one first, which is um, both drivers are going to have to vacate their seats anyway at some point this season. So... um, I don't believe Hamilton's vacated this season. I don't have the the stats up front of me. That's not happened yet. So um, that will come later in the season and certainly Antonelli will drive then. And everything is trending towards him being given the seat for next year. And our colleague Ronald Vording was in a a media session with Toto Wolff over the weekend. And there was a, let's just, I think Mercedes would like it if I just put a slight hint that Antonelli would play a larger part in the team next year. I'll put it like that. Um, just to make sure that people aren't upset with me. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so everything's trending towards the direction of Antonelli getting the seat for next season. Um, I think Mercedes has has trended that way for a while. I think they've um, been, you know, they've obviously been very very enthusiastic about his, his talent and his potential. Um, we're going to get to see that on the weekend. I think you know it's going to be a lot of pressure for him. Um, I suppose the home race is kind of throw him in at the deep end and, and see if he sinks or swims. I imagine he'll swim. He's had a lot of preparation for th- for this moment. Um, and although his Formula 2 season hasn't gone to plan, I think the series itself is becoming sort of more and more in, in irrelevance. It's all about how these drivers work with F1 teams now, not how they perform in a series where there's a lot of kind of noise let's say you've got a lot of you've got reverse grids not particularly great reliability these sort of fluctuations in performance that kind of thing what you want is a really nice stable junior series where there isn't any of that where it's re- the race are really really boring but you can get a really good data set of who's good and who's not and i think um actually for these young driver academies to pick up these drivers and and put them through their paces and tests and previous car testing and simulator sessions that kind of thing that's the only really way real way to gauge them and clearly mercedes is very hot on antonelli at the moment yeah and the other thing is i mean the only reason why antonelli hasn't been announced in my view is because toto was still hoping to get max at some point so because antonelli is under lock and key as as his driver he could have waited until abu dhabi to announce him as long as there's a sliver of hope that max might be persuaded to join mercedes then you know there's no reason to announce antonelli yet um, but I think that an announcement seems to be coming soon also you know, shows that he's sort of given up on that. And uh, Toto revealed that he had, had some talks over the summer with, with the Verstappen camp where they sort of agreed that, yeah, we, you know, we would like to theoretically work together at some point, but it's not going to happen in 2025. So let's just move on. You know, Max moves on with Red Bull. Toto moves on with his plans for his drivers. So I think that probably means that that 1% chance of, oh, 
however much it was that Max would join Red Bull next year, um, would join Mercedes next year, that is now become zero. So then that means there's no reason to wait. Um, um, just announce Antonelli, just, you know, let him adjust to that attention, to that pressure uh, for the rest of the season. So you can sort of ease into it more. He's already in demand, um, obviously. Um, yeah, there's no need to wait. Just let him adjust to that status of, uh, of being uh, an F1 driver. Let him work out what he's going to buy with all that money. <laughs> That's what he's got to do. Uh, look, gents, we're about to end it there. But before we do, wild predictions then. And I'm going to force a question upon you and then ask you for any any beautiful little nuggets you can give us ahead of it. But prediction-wise, 30 points in the Constructors. McLaren now trailing Red Bull. What will the deficit be come the end of Monza, Phil? Ooh, putting me on a spot there because I have to like... Um, try and do mass, which is uh, quite a challenge. Um, well, I do predict uh, Lando will win again, and Oscar will be th- third on the podium. So that's uh, so the then, gap's going to close in your yeah, opinion. The gap is going to close. So say Max uh, takes second, Perez fifth. Uh, quick mass. Let's say twenty. No, sixteen points for you. So fourteen points. Wow, I was actually just going for a rough idea, but thank you. For- there you actually, go. Indeed. I thought that you were is, actually asking me a math question. No, actually. it was more like, you know, but it, but it doesn't look, you've dealt with it beautifully. Now, JB, I've got to somehow top that. Oh, I'll say 14 points as well then. Um, <laughs> That's very poor. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm excited about Monza because last year, Ferrari just sort of thought, well, we're not going to do particularly well. So we'll just throw everything at a Monza upgrade. They might do the same again because obviously things haven't been great. And they'll want to do well there. So they might be a contender. Um, Mercedes might be a contender. So I don't think it's quite as clear cut as Red Bull versus McLaren. I think we'll have a few more factors in that. And I think, therefore, um, one of the Red Bull drivers finishes a little bit further down the points. Another one sort of there or thereabouts with the podium. Um, Yeah. So I don't know. It could be anywhere between 30 something and uh, no points. Somewhere in there. Right, thanks very much. But your instinct, JBL, just to be clear, is that you think the gap might close a little bit, but you don't know by what. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm just hopeful for an exciting but That's rest. all I was hoping for, that kind of answer. Really. That's <laughs> yeah, what, something like I, that. I, yeah. that's I reckon everyone's switched want. off. Everyone's switched off by now. But listen, gents, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. We'll have to see how it plays out over the course of this weekend, but it's been an absolute pleasure as always. And before we disappear off, let's have a quick look at the championship standings. Well, it's Max Verstappen still leads the way, but the gap is coming down. Just 70 points now separate him and Lando Norris in the McLaren. Then it's Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari, Oscar Piastri in the McLaren. Another Ferrari, Carlos Sainz this time in fifth, Hamilton in sixth, and Sergio Perez in seventh, Russell eight, Alonso nine, and Lance Stroll in tenth. Still yet to score, and it's the Saubers of Guan Yu, Bottas, and the Williams of Logan Sargent. As for the constructors, well, Red Bull lead the way, but that gap is now shockingly small. 30 points now separate them and McLaren in second, then Ferrari on 370 points, Mercedes, Aston Martin and RB in sixth, Haas 7, Alpine 8, and down at the bottom, yet to score, yep, it's Sauber. Well, there you go. That just about does it for our Dutch Grand Prix analysis. Don't forget to subscribe to stay across all of our coverage ahead of this Grand Prix, including the video coverage across all of the days at Monza. Until next time, though, thanks for watching.